when 97-year-old Merce Hershey stunned Good Morning America viewers with her weightlifting abilities, my attention was drawn to the man standing by her as she trained. He is physical therapist and strength trainer Chris Rees, and he and his fellow coaches at Starting Strength Gym in Cincinnati helped Merce not only build muscle, but gain bone density in her late 90s. I wanted to find out how, so he's here today to share some incredibly inspiring and motivating stories of clients whose lives have been turned around through strength training. And he shares the key to building muscle and bone mass and how we too can do it at any age. Chris, welcome to the channel. Thank you, I appreciate you having me. You have the ideal background to talk not just about strength training, but how it relates to our health and mobility as we age, because as well mm -hmm. as being a strength coach, you are also a physical therapist. Correct. Yeah. Would you mind just talking us through your experience as a PT and why ultimately you wanted to branch out a little uh, to focus more on muscular strength for your clients? Sure. So, you know, I grew up as an athlete. I was a distance runner actually for 20 years. Uh, started real young, you know, and competed through college and beyond and uh, marathons, the whole deal, right? A lot of running. And so I was just interested in the body and how it works and how to optimize performance and, um, you know, how I think ultimately, as far as physical therapy goes, how could I bring this to other people, help them improve their physical situation, whether it be injury, pain, just overall improving their quality of life. And so naturally physical therapy, you know, was, was an easy choice. The more I learned about it, the more I got excited about it. Of course, went through school, right? It's, um, it's a three year graduate program, right? You do a lot of uh, clinical rotations, you know, so I started practicing in 2016 and, you know, standard new therapist, just kind of trying to get my feet under me. And I think even through school, I had questions about some of the things we were doing, some of the methods and some of the interventions that we would use, modalities. Some of it just didn't make sense to me. Um, and I think through early practice, I kind of felt like, man, this stuff doesn't work as well as I thought it should. I can distinctly remember patients that followed everything I gave them. They did everything I told them to do, and they kind of didn't get a whole lot better. And I felt like, now what, you know? And so 2021, through my own training, so I gradually transitioned away from running, became more of a weightlifter. I found Starting Strength. Uh, it there's a there's a book it's called Starting Strength, basic barbell training. Just looking to get better, you know, for my own training, learn my understand my own lifting better, you know, make progress, all that kind of stuff, right? And I read the book and was blown away. Um, it's just it's a very very comprehensive strength training manual really uh that lays out a fantastic method that works really well so of course i'm using it on myself and i'm learning along the way uh that man this has a lot of application i think for my patients you know a lot of times we're looking at strength as being a deficit that we need to improve and a lot of the tools again the tools and the methods that i had been taught didn't seem to be very effective and so this book highlighted for me what looked like a much better approach using it in my own lifting saw a lot of progress a lot of results um, you know, shattered old, you know, PRs, so to speak, right? My personal best were getting much better. And so I started trying to implement this gradually in the clinic and just found out that it was far more effective than a lot of what I had been using. And so just, you know, on the website, getting engaged and in, in understanding what this starting strength company is all about. You know, they're starting to put gyms around the country. Uh, they offer a coaching credential. And so I pursued that. It's very difficult to get. Um, you know, far beyond what your average personal trainer is ever going to encounter through their education and started, you know, coaching part time in the gyms and still practicing PT as well, trying to implement more and more of what I had learned through starting strength, what I was seeing and learning in the gyms and ultimately got to where I, I simply felt like I was much more effective implementing the starting strength method with we call members, right? They're essentially patients, right? They're trying to improve their physical situation. They may not have an injury necessarily. Um, or any kind of a condition they're trying to overcome. They just want to live a better life. They want to be strong. They want to be healthy. Um, and so I just I felt like I was much more effective in the gyms with this method, with the equipment to conduct this method, uh, you know, appropriately. I've gradually transitioned away from PT and just primarily work full time in the gyms. And, you know, I'm, I'm curious to sort of um, dig into some of the key differences there, because obviously... We call it physiotherapy in, in the sure, UK, sure. but physical therapy. 
Um, you know, if we were recovering from injury, surgery or whatever, um, what would some of the key tools you would use through physical therapy be uh, for people who are, hope, who are looking to build back um, through rehabilitation? Sure. And how would that differ? We know that um, in the gym, your strength training. Would, mm -hmm. What is the difference between them in, in terms of the tools that you use in physical therapy and the kind of results? Because you talked about the strength training being more effective. What is it more effective at, do you think, in terms of the end result for the patient? One of the giant elephant in the room misunderstandings uh, that the vast majority of the medical profession has, along with just lay people as well, you know, weight training and resistance training is not the same thing as strength training. Simply picking up a three pound dumbbell and doing something with it is not necessarily gonna make you stronger. It depends on the person and their level of strength kind of coming into that exercise, right? Um, in, in physical therapy, we have uh, ankle weights, we have TheraBand, which everybody's probably familiar with, small, light dumbbells, um, sometimes cable column type machines where we can use some progressive resistance. Many times in physical therapy, the approach is, you know, if you've got an injured knee or you've had surgery on your knee, we are going to focus on the knee and the muscles around the knee and really ignore most everything else. Um, you know, obviously post-surgical, depending on the injury, right? We're going to work on range of motion. So stretching and things like that, returning the joint to normal range and then progress to strengthening, again, the muscles around it. And a lot of times, you know, if you're looking at the knee, for example, you might be also looking at the hip. But we're going to stay pretty focused on that one leg. And we're going to do a lot of isolation type movements with relatively light loads. Um, certainly post-surgically, light loads are appropriate, but there has to be a progression in order to return that person to everyday function. And most clinics simply don't have the equipment to allow for that progression. In our starting strength gyms, and I say all the time that the starting strength gym looks like a, an outpatient clinic should look, barbells and squat racks. That's all we got. And we are going to use full body, you know, multi-joint compound movements that are going to train the whole body as a system. And so whether or not, you know, whether it's your knee or your hip or your whatever, we can apply a more appropriate load to your whole system using basic human movements and then using a tool like the barbell to load that human movement pattern. By not isolating just on that one area, we can strengthen everything around it and that one area receives its appropriate amount of stress to make progress a lot more effectively. And so you're changing the tissue, right? You're making muscles stronger, bones denser, connected, connective tissue stronger, uh, the joints respond really well to that cyclic loading pattern that weight training provides or strength training provides. And you're able to apply loads more effectively to the whole system and not just one area. Because at the end of the day, you know, you put a three pound ankle weight on and make somebody do leg raises, their, their quad's going to burn, right? But that's not really limited by their absolute strength. It's very stressful in a local area from a metabolic standpoint, but it's not terribly stressful systemically. And so you're able to apply a heck of a lot more stress to your system as a whole. And you can do that effectively with, again, co multi-joint compound movements with a loaded barbell. Um, and again, you see them actually get stronger. You know, somebody who's been in a brace for six weeks, comes out of the brace, able to start moving their leg, you know, you can do almost anything with them that activates their quadricep, for example, and you will see progress with their strength. But that approach will stop working fairly quickly and they will be far from where they need to be to resume a normal life, whether it be stairs or certainly with an athlete, who's got to get a heck of a lot stronger than, you know, just coming out of that brace, right? You've got to have a method that allows them to get significantly stronger and not just a little bit stronger. And I think that's, again, a misunderstanding just generally, you know, a relatively untrained person or an untrained limb that has been immobilized for some reason will adapt readily to almost anything and they will get stronger. But a lot of those methods are not going to be effective beyond three, four weeks, maybe, very quickly that will stop working and you'll need something else. And with the approach that we use, again, with these multi-joint, full body, load the system type movements, make every piece do its respective role, the sky's the limit. You can progress those movements for literally decades and make progress. Now it slows down after a while, but it still keeps moving. Um, and you'll see strength levels just far beyond what you could ever achieve simply with ankle weights on a table. Gosh. 
Um, I didn't realise that ten minutes into this conversation, I'd be <laughs> I'd be finishing up thinking I'm going to have to start lift, lifting barbells in the gym now. I mean, yeah. I often joke that I go down there and I, you know, I pull a few weights and I do a few lifts sure. and all the rest of it, and then I head straight to the sauna. Yeah, that's yeah. what gets me in the door. But but you're convincing me. I mean, essentially, what I hear you say is you think pretty much everybody should be lifting barbells. Yes. Um, you know, at Starting Strength, we really believe strength is important to our our physical existence. It's the thing that makes everything else you do better. There's never a situation where, you know, you're too strong for something, right? Um, getting stronger will make everything else you do better. Uh, we have countless examples of members in the gym who they, they start training with us. They're with us for you know, four weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks, and they go to do X, Y, Z thing that they've always kind of struggled with, that they've always avoided, and suddenly it's easy. And they're like, wow, I, I just did that thing. 50 pound bag of dog food that I used to drag and wrestle with to get in the garage. Now I just pick it up and carry it. It's no big deal. Uh, we, had, we had a patient talk about, you know, she's got a water softener in the basement and she drags these 40 pound bags of salt. Used to have to go one at a time and really kind of, you know, struggle with that. Now she just takes them two at a time like it's like it's just another trip down the stairs. You know, so getting stronger makes you better at everything else you do. Every interaction with your environment is force production and increasing your strength increases your ability to produce force. And when you do movements that train the entire body together, that mimics real life a lot more closely, right? You're, you're rarely ever using parts of your body in isolation with everyday movements. So if you train them in these compound movements, all of the muscles of your spine get trained, all of the muscles of your trunk, your abdominals, your shoulders, your legs, it all gets worked together. And so it's better able to function together, again, in everyday life situations. It's simply not even a comparison to try to take somebody, put them on these artificial machines that isolate certain joints. Um, that person will never get as strong and never function as well as somebody who's been training, you know, normal human movement patterns and training the system together as a whole. I mean, it's, there's just mountains of data. Um, you know, we've collected a lot of it in our gyms. A lot of it has been collected prior to that in the, in the publishing and writing of this book, which was, you know, written in 2005. It, it's just the way it is. And contrary to most of what you see in everyday commercial gyms, machines are not what you should be spending your time on. The treadmill is not what you should be spending your time on. If your quality of life, if you want to improve your quality of life, or, or in a lot of cases, maintain it, getting strong is your best approach and the barbell is the best tool for that. So sitting there on my mobile phone while I do a few leg lifts, it's not going to cut it anymore, is it, Chris? Uh-uh. Uh-uh. We have a... <laughs> so Mark Ripito is the author of the book, right? And he's got a lot of quotes. He's a he's an excellent personality, humorous, uh, intelligent. One of his quotes, and it's on the wall in our gyms, easy doesn't work. You know, if it's easy, it's not going to change you, right? If you want to change, you got to challenge yourself in some way. We talk a lot about stress recovery adaptation. You know, our bodies are built to adapt to stress. And if they're not being stressed, they simply won't change. They won't adapt. I'm sure everybody has been to the gym and done XYZ exercise for X number of weeks, months, and seen no progress and wondered why. If it's not hard, it's not going to change you. And it doesn't matter what you're trying to do, whether it's improve your cardiovascular fitness or your strength or whatever in the gym. If it's not hard, it's not going to change you. And, you know, the other thing that I think people need to understand, you know, hard is specific. How is it hard, right? In what way is it stressing your body? Because that's the way it will adapt. And so you jump on a machine and you crank out, you know, 20 leg lifts, 20 leg extensions or whatever. Um, it may be hard. How is it hard, right? It's hard from a metabolic standpoint. You feel the burn in your quad. You've got a lot of metabolic waste building up because you just did 20 reps. Um, it's not heavy though, right? And that's a kind of a difficult concept for people to understand. You know, rep 20 was hard because you were tired and because your quad was burning because of all this waste accumulating in your leg but it wasn't hard because it was heavy, right? In our gyms, a lot of times we'll do sets of five at most. And from the very first rep, it's heavy and it's challenging and it's difficult to do. And so by the time you get to rep five, you know, they've all been heavy. And so the hard has been the weight and the force that you've had to produce to move it. And so you will adapt specifically to that stress by getting stronger. You know, again, sets of 15, sets of 20, sets of beyond, they're, not, they're hard, 
They're difficult, but not in the way that you want if your goal is to get stronger. It has to be heavy in order for you to get stronger. And so that's, again, the adaptation is very specific. Understanding that concept, again, if your goal is to get strong, that would really change the way a lot of people approach their exercise. Yeah, no, that has really, really landed with me and I, I bet it will um, land with a lot of people. One of the things I, I, I say often on this channel, but I think it's a thing that motivates me most of all to do what I do because I've picked up for, for years and then when you land in your 50s yourself, you've become more interested in it from a personal level. But as people age, I think there's a mindset for most people that it's downhill from here physically. Right. You know, yeah. things start to set in and there's no overcoming them. There's no getting mm -hmm. stronger in your 70s. And then you start to see people who actually do it. And that's the wonderful thing. There's a lot that's wrong with social media, but it's the wonderful thing about social media that mm -hmm. you can be scrolling on Instagram and see, uh, as I did, a 72-year-old bodybuilder. She was on the channel the other week. This was a woman oh. who was had mobility problems in her 50s. Um, and uh, she started weight training in her later 60s and st started the comp or in her 60s and she started competitions in her later 60s mm -hmm. and um she she believes she's in the best shape of her life at 72 and so <laughs> many people were inspired and that's why i really wanted to talk to you because i can see that you have multiple people in your own gym who have similar experiences of getting stronger in later life yeah. I mean, can you tell us about some of the clients that kind of stand out to you uh, from that level? Older sure. clients who've come in in one condition and after some training left yeah. completely different. I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head, though. Uh, the big picture, right? As we get older, the biggest thing that we lose is our strength. We're not as strong as we were when we were younger. And there's a lot of other things that are changing, too. But the big one that affects our quality of life and and affects our ability to do the things that we like to do is our decreasing strength. Um, and so if you're an older adult and you're trying to hang on to those things or get them back, getting stronger is the best thing you can do. That's the, that's the number one way that you will achieve that, right? Um, you know, you, you probably have seen Merce, right? She's 97, about to be 98, right. I think, in November. She was on Good Morning America, am I right? She was, yeah, yeah. She's, you know, and she's an excellent example. She came to us at like 95, um, very independent, uh, had been living on her own, walking without a walker up until around like 92, I believe, uh, age 92, right? Um, and was actually, uh, she fell, somebody ran into her coming around a corner in a supermarket and just ran into her and she fell down. So she had, a, I think, a, a, a lumbar fracture, Obviously had to recover from that much weaker, deconditioned, um, I believe had to move in with her son, had to start using a walker and, and just saw like a pretty, you know, rapid decline. In her well, for most people uh, that happens to somebody at that age, you think that's the beginning yeah. of the end there. Right, They're absolutely. Not coming yeah, back from absolutely. That. But instead she walked into your gym. Yeah, she came to us. She was 95. In fact, I, I, I was talking to her son and trying to kind of talk to him about our gyms and the program and all that kind of stuff. And she, he said, do you think this would work for my mom? And he said, well, tell me about her, you know, I'm sure it will. And so he gave me the scoop and she came in and, and uh, you know, started training with us and she's been with us ever since. Now, you know, she's 95, right? Or she's 97 now. I'm, so, I'm sorry, 97, yeah. The biggest thing for her is um, the walker is, is necessary because her balance is not very good. And that's not because of her strength. Most of the time balance will get significantly better if you get somebody stronger. It's to the point where you can eliminate walkers and canes and things like that, no problem. But in her case, she's got pretty severe neuropathy. So she's got very little sensation in her feet and her legs. And so she's not getting the same kind of feedback from the ground that a normal person would get. And so that's the biggest reason she still uses the walker. Um, and I, I, I say all the time, like she's made progress in our gym, absolutely, right? I mean, the day that she came in, we had her pick up like 11 pounds from a spot just above her knee, right? So we'll take a move like a deadlift, which is generally picked up off the floor and we'll elevate it inside the rack and reduce the range of motion. So for her, this was a uh, just above her knee and she stood up with 11 pounds, right? And got to where she picked up like 55 for a set of three from the floor. Right now, she's at a point where she's lifting uh, just over 90 pounds 
for a, you know, from a position just below her knee, right? So significantly stronger in our gym. And she has been able to maintain a level of independ independence and regain some level of independence that she otherwise wouldn't have gotten. And I think for her, so she's, we've got great stories too regarding her, her bone density, right? You know, she had a DEXA scan uh, maybe four or five months ago. They're seeing improvement in her spine. She, the woman's 97, right? Her right, spine- That blew my mind that that can impact bone density. You can improve your bone density in your late 90s. Right, I mean, right. So, you know, I think uh, they looked at her hips, her hips are stable, you know, that didn't get better, but didn't get worse. And then her spine is improving. And so for someone at that stage, right, if you can simply maintain, you're doing really good, right? I mean, at that, at that point in life, a lot, you know, anybody who's that age is probably declining somewhat rapidly. And so if you can just slow that down or, or stop it, that's a win, right? That's, that's a huge win. She's able to maintain her level of independence. She's, you know, uh, she, she could with her walker, you know, her endurance for walking is fantastic. If she does happen to fall again, because she's got denser bones, you know, the likelihood of a fracture, another fracture is, is less, right? Is much lower. So, um, you know, it, it's, it, it certainly speaks to, you know, the person who's out there saying, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm 68 and eh, I'm, I'm, I'm too old for that. I can't make any progress. You absolutely can with the right approach and the right program. Um, we have another woman, uh, her name is Cheryl. She's probably, she's in her early sixties, like 63, 64, um, loves to ride horses, right? Came to us because she recognized that she wasn't as strong as she used to be in certain things with, you know, the equipment and just simply getting on and riding the horse. She just wasn't as good with, right? Um, she started, could not squat an 11 pound bar to a box and stand back up. Uh, the very first day she came to me, I gave her the lightest bar we had and she squatted down to the box and she couldn't get back up, right? She was stuck at the bottom. Um, and now the, she's squatting like this week, I think she's going to squat like 73 or 74 pounds for sets of two. Uh, she'll squat, you know, 60 something pounds, um, you know, for sets of three earlier in the week. Uh, you know, she's picking up off the floor, right? Deadlifting. We started her as light as we could possibly go, which is like 31 pounds. She's pulling 155 for three this week. Right. This woman is dis her, her body is different. Right. I don't think um, it's hard to convey, you know, the, the, the shape of her spine and her muscles and her just overall ability to function in a physical world from where she started to where she is now. She's an entirely different person. She used to really struggle and was really not able to carry the saddles and get them up on the horse. Now she can do that no problem, right? She used to use the block to climb up on the horse, and now she can just throw her foot up in the stirrup and swing her leg over no problem. Um, it's those kinds of things. Like that's a meaningful change in her life that everybody else around her notices, right? She's the only one in her riding group that can get on the horse that way. And it's because she got stronger. It's not because she got more flexible. It's not because she was, you know, increasing her cardiovascular endurance. You know, it's not because she took supplement X or whatever. It's because she got stronger. And I think you simply can't underestimate the impact that getting stronger can have again even for somebody who's in their 60s um, and who might otherwise feel like well this is just kind of where i'm at one of the people that stands out to me that i started working with when the light bulb really clicked i think for this approach and the the, the importance of getting stronger was a woman like mid 50s maybe 56 57 came into my clinic this was as a, as a therapist right you know, had back pain, went to the doctor and doctor pretty much said, well, this is just kind of how it is. You're getting older. You're not going to be able to carry your grandkids around. You can't get down on the floor with them anymore. Your back hurts. That's just how it is. And we're going to give you these pain relieving, you know, either a shot, a, you know, medication, whatever to try to manage symptoms. You know, I'm going to send you to therapy. And so she comes in really down, de dejected, like, man, I, this is where I'm at now. Like, I, I thought I could, you know, play with my grandkids and carry them and lift them and help out and get on the floor and do all those things. And I told her, I said, well, it doesn't have to be this way. Let me show you some stuff. Let, let me show you what your back can do. And let me show you the path to get it stronger. And I, it was one of the days that, you know, we had set up the deadlift and she was working on it. And she got up to something like 55 pounds. Not a lot of weight on the deadlift, even for a woman in that situation, right? But for her, 55 pounds was just like this astronomical number. And she did a set of five with it and she set it down and you could just see the look on her face. Like I'm not broken. I can get better. My back is not, you know, this fragile thing that I have to baby the rest of my life. 
there's a better way I can get better. You know, what the doctor told me is not the end all be all. So that for me was just such a light bulb moment. Like, you know, a lot of the things that you do in a PT clinic, whether it be exercise on the table, the core exercises, any number of things, they won't provide that level of confidence and change kind of that flip that switch in your mind that, Hey, I am capable. My back is not fragile. I can make this better. You know, you get somebody picking up weights off the floor. They never dreamed they could lift or they, you know, I thought their days lifting that kind of weight were over. You flip that switch. You make them believe like I, I am strong. I can get better. And the ripple effect into the rest of their life is just, you, you really can't put a price tag on it. And um, again, you, you can't do that when you're doing easy isolation lightweight exercise it's just not going to make that change oh i cannot hear those stories enough i just i think it's incredible it's like the modern miracle the thing that we've missed yeah. in the world for so long we thought age equal decline and and that was a given there will be people watching who will say i, I would love to do that but you know i've got this injury or you know um i, I have this long-term back condition or whatever it is and that rules me out who is ruled out from strength training? Almost nobody. Um, there are, you know, exceptions regarding certain neurological conditions that will prevent your body from adapting to the stress of, you know, progressive force application, right? Um, that is most orthopedic conditions can be accommodated and a lot of times overcome with the right approach. Um, we have, a wide range of modifications that we can make to the basic lifts. I and mean, when I say basic lifts, I'm talking basic, basic human movements, movement patterns that most people are going to do, whether they ever walk into a gym or not, right? Squat, right? Everyone's going to sit down, stand up during the day. Um, you know, deadlift, we're going to bend over and pick something up off the floor. Um, pressing something up overhead, pushing something away from us, pulling something towards us. These are basic movements that everybody's going to do in one way or another, the barbell simply provides an er ergonomic way to load those movement patterns. Almost everybody will be able to squat either with a bar. Now, I mentioned Merce, right? 97. She's pretty kyphotic, right? She's kind of hunched over a little bit. She can't, you know, she can't put a bar on her back. So we put a weighted vest on her, right? Uh, we have tools to progressively load that movement pattern for her. Uh, we have, uh, we call it a safety squat bar, right? So a lot of times shoulder mobility will prevent somebody from being able to put a bar on their back and hold it correctly, keep it up from, you know, off of their neck. A lot of us have been on computers or worked at a desk and we're really kind of hunched forward. And so we lack the shoulder mobility to get the bar in the right place on the back, in a safe place on the back. So the safety squat bar provides a padded way to set the bar on your back and your shoulders and the hands go in front. And so shoulder mobility out the window, not a barrier, right? Um, I mentioned before rack pull, uh, it's a modified deadlift, shortens the range of motion, brings a bar up off the floor. Uh, for whatever reason, if you can't get all the way down to the floor, not strong enough, or have some limitation, either back, hip. We get people too. Limitations a lot of times can be in their head. They're just fearful of pulling from the floor. And so we're, hey, well, let's start in the rack and we can progress you down towards the floor, um, progress weight gradually. They, they handle it just fine, right? Again, show them something they can do that they can tolerate and you make progression from there very gradually, very slowly. You know, again, same with the overhead press, the bench press. I had a woman not too long ago came to us really severe shoulder arthritis, right? Like just could not raise her arm much, you know, beyond the side of her body, had a lot of pain with that. So we didn't press, we did a lat pull down instead. Um, she could bench with no pain, so we benched. We squatted with the safety squat bar that I mentioned, put her shoulder in a very comfortable position, didn't bother her at all. We could still strengthen her back and her legs very effectively. There is all, almost always a way to modify those parent lifts. And in many cases, you know, maybe you never make a progression back to what we call the parent lift or kind of the normal way of lifting, right? Uh, but the vast majority of our lifters, regardless of their age, are able to get back to that normal lift and do the lift kind of in the normal way and don't need those modifications over time. I can't think of a time that we've told somebody, yeah, you know what? I don't think this is going to work. We can't help you. Um, if they're willing, there's always a way for us to try to, you know, get as close to that parent movement as possible. And then we just make progressions from there. How quickly can you make a difference? Do you think, um, how many gym sessions a week for how long to see a difference? I would say the vast majority of our lifters within the first month are probably going to feel different. 
maybe do something again. I mentioned just day to day stuff. They're like, hey, that was easier than I thought it would be, or that that's easier than it usually is. Certainly, after two to three months, they're feeling some changes. Um, you know, I mentioned Cheryl recently. Um, who rides horses. I mean, she's been with us maybe six, seven months and we've made a significant change for her. So it doesn't take long. You know, we tell lifters all the time, all I gotta do is show up. We handle the programming, we'll handle the, you know, making sure you're moving correctly, safely, um, and the process works. And if you're able to add weight, you should add weight. If you're able to add weight three days a week when you come to us, you should add weight three days a week. There's no reason to do it any slower. And it's not that we're being aggressive, but the adaptation, especially early on, will occur quickly. And so there's no reason to say, well, we're going to stay at weight X for eight weeks and then we're going to move up. Because after session one or two, you're not getting any stronger. You're just doing the same thing over and over. And your body says, hey, I'm adapted to this. I don't have to change. I can do this already. You have to give it a reason to change. And so we take the weight up a little bit, right? A lot of times we use five pounds. Again, depending on the lifter, it might be two and a half pounds. Merce goes up one pound every other week on that rack pull because that's the rate of change that her body can accommodate. But she's still going up at 97. This is what I can't get my head around. She's still going up. She's still making progress, yeah. Now, again, she started training pretty late in life. If she had been training you know, when she was 40, of course, she'd be maybe regressing and, and kind of on the downslide now, but she would have started from a much higher point and she would have made that descent a lot more gradual and a lot slower and would still be far beyond most people her age. But yeah, because she came to us so late in life and had not gone through this process before, yeah, she's got potential for progress, you know, still. I mean, for somebody at home who's thinking, well, I can't afford to join a gym or have a personal trainer, but they have been inspired to make some changes. Where could they begin? You know, what, what are some, what, some equipment or what are things that you could do at home? Well, the, the, the first thing I would say in that situation is buy the book. Starting Strength, Basic Barbell Training. The book is available for like 30 bucks. It is an absolute steal for $30. It really should cost about five times that much. It's, okay, it's, I'm going to read it. You've totally convinced me. <laughs> it is... Uh, it is much more valuable in my mind than any textbook I ever saw in school. It is excellent. It's very well written. There's a very detailed and comprehensive explanation for why we do what we do. And really, um, if you do nothing else, pick that book up and read like the first couple pages. It just really lays out an excellent case for why, who cares, why strength? Why should we even care about being strong? I, I periodically go back and read those pages just to remind myself what we're doing. And it, it's extremely motivating. So start there, right? Get educated on, well, why should I get stronger and how should I get stronger? Because there's a case made early in the book about, well, why should I use a barbell? Why not machines or why not? You know, there's millions of other ways that somebody can, you know, exercise. Um, why barbells? Why should I, why should I use this equipment, right? Excellent case made for that. So I think step one for 30 bucks, get educated. It's difficult to carry out this process kind of by the book, so to speak, without a squat rack and a barbell and some plates, which is not an astronomical amount of money. Um, you can certainly find things used. You can find, you know, off brand or not name brand items. Uh, there's a lot of used exercise equipment out there through you know, various websites and things like that. So it can be purchased and really you only need enough weight to get started, you can add weight as you get stronger. But the most important concept to understand if you're trying to get stronger, which I think everybody should, is you have to be able to go up in weight. And so we pick exercises and implements that allow us to make, you know, uh, precise jumps in weight. And so if you're at home and you're like, well, I already do squats. If you pick up the same, you know, 12 pound kettlebell every time you do squats you're not getting stronger you're you're burning some calories and you're getting out of breath and you're probably getting sweaty and you might even get sore from time to time but you're not getting stronger because you're not asking your muscles to make more force than it than they require to lift this 12 pound you know weight more reps doesn't do it it has to be more load it has to be more force so if you're working out at home you got to have a way to make progress with the weight that you're lifting. So, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, again, push-ups, right? Everyone loves push-ups. If you just start doing them, they'll probably move the needle for you. But after a while, there's got to be a way to load that movement and progress the resistance. 
So that would be kind of step one, whatever regimen you're using now, whatever you're doing, if your goal is to get stronger, you've got to progress the load. And so either buying additional weights or, um, you know, some people like to work out with bands at home. You have to increase the band tension somehow, double up the band, whatever. Um, it's got to get harder tomorrow than it is today. And finally, do you recommend that um, clients take particular supplements, especially as they age? Uh, are, are, you, are you suggesting they take anything at home or and, and or follow a particular diet? What's your recommendation around that? Our main, our main recommendation is to um, get enough protein. Your, there, there's, I've listened to a lot of stuff online. Uh, we certainly see it. I see it in my own training. I see it with clients. The, the traditional recommended amount of protein for the average adult is, is just far below what would be considered optimal. It's there to prevent deficiency, but it's certainly not optimal. So if you're looking for optimal health, uh, it's got to be higher. And certainly if you're doing a strength training program and you're progressing weights and you're trying to go up in weight and get stronger, you need even more, right? So we emphasize with our clients one gram per pound of body weight or two grams per kilogram body weight. In many cases, that's enough. For the average trainee just trying to get strong and make progress with this program, that's enough. And when you're getting that amount of protein, the training goes really well and you're able to make consistent, predictable progress. A lot of lifters that struggle, that's the first question we ask them. If they're, you know, we expected them to hit a certain weight or a certain lift and they didn't, that's usually the first place we go. And a lot of times we're encouraging and trying to educate lifters on the stuff you do outside the gym for your recovery. And that's primarily your nutrition and your sleep. That stuff is as important as anything you're going to do in the gym. And quite honestly, it's a bigger burden than what you do in the gym. You show up in the gym, hour and a half, three days a week, not a big deal. Meal after meal, night after night, getting the sleep, getting the protein. That's the real challenge. Um, certainly in the context of a busy, <laughs> full life, right? It's difficult to get that, you know, that, that consistent level of protein and sleep. Um, and so we encourage lifters to track their protein intake over a day or two. I'm not a big tracker. Um, with regard to diet, I don't think it's terribly practical for most people, but track so you have some idea of where you are. Because in many cases, people are far below where they think they are. And then you start to look at, okay, well, gosh, at breakfast, really, I kind of run out the door and I, I grab a, an apple or a, a cup of yogurt or something quick. Gosh, there's really not much protein there. I, I really need to work on breakfast because I, I do okay for lunch and maybe for dinner, but breakfast is really lacking. You know, or if you've got three good meals, but you're still coming up a bit short, you try to bump the meals up and then maybe think about either a protein shake or a bar or some kind of a snack in between meals to increase protein. One of the things we promote a lot that just gets, you know, uh, a lot of different uh, reactions is we want people gaining weight. And that's really not something you hear anywhere else. But if you're going to add muscle and you're going to get stronger, you're going to get heavier. And a lot of clients that struggle with us are just... For one reason or another, they are against gaining any weight. And if you want to grow, you know, more muscle tissue, there's more of you, you're going to weigh more. And so we're encouraging, encouraging them to eat enough to provide for that weight gain. And, and again, if you're doing an appropriate strength training program, the vast majority of that weight gain will be muscle. And any you're going to pick up some fat, but for the most part, you know, it, it's not something you're going to notice. You're going to be much more... Um, you know, focused on, wow, I'm getting stronger. I can see, you know, my traps are sticking out. My shoulders are wider. You know, my pants fit tighter in the thighs, you know, those kinds of things, the, the good kind of weight gain. You know, again, almost all of our, a lot of our lifters come to us um, underweight. And so for the vast majority, we're encouraging them eat more, eat more. I want the scale going up. Now, you know, we don't encourage that indefinitely, right? Uh, we don't want, you know, everybody to be 400 pounds and, you know, lifting crazy amounts of weight. But certainly, you know, if you're, if you're underweight, if your BMI is considered normal, I don't really have a lot of faith in the BMI. I think that's a, a flawed scale, but, you know, it, it probably needs to be a little bit heavier. And there's a lot of research studies that look at longevity and mortality, and the best scores are generally in the overweight category. So having a little extra is a good thing. And if you're doing a strength training program, you're going to have more muscle and just more and more evidence and studies coming out now showing the, the you know, presence of muscle mass being a great indicator for longevity and, and decreased mortality. Well, you've given me a lot to think about today, that's for <laughs> sure. Uh, I'm going to have to rethink my ways at the gym. <laughs> 
because I'm, I'm like, oh, this isn't too bad, this gym life, you know? I can still, I can reply to my emails when I'm on the machine. Uh -huh. Not anymore. <laughs> well, so, you know, one of the other things that, that's kind of different for us too, we, we like lifters taking plenty of rest in between sets because they're heavy. And I can do that. Yeah, <laughs> right, you got that part. Uh, but if you're working really hard for a set of three, set of five, you know, a really, really heavy set. And I would say that a lot of our, a lot of our clients come to us. They don't understand what a really heavy set feels like. They've not ever done a really heavy hard rep where they stand up number two and they got to do a third one and they're not sure they can do it. Uh, and they, they, you know, they try, right. And a lot of times they get it. Of course they surprise themselves, but, um, you know, if you do that kind of effort, there's got to be enough rest in between so you can recover. And so then that's the, the time you could reply to emails or do other things like that. But um, yeah, I mean, again, I, I can't I, I can't stress enough. I've seen it time after time. You know, getting stronger makes everything better. You know, bones re respond just like muscles. When you load them, when you load systemically, load the spine, load the legs with a squat, with a deadlift, with a press, they get denser. That's why the bones get denser. They respond to stress like anything else. And uh, when that stress is applied appropriately with the correct starting point and then a, you know, an appropriate progression, the bones get denser. They don't break. You know, we had a woman recently that I've had to have a lot of conversations with about like, we're not going to break your back. We're starting you light enough. We're progressing you slow enough. Your bones are adapting as we do this. And I think a lot of times there are conditions where osteoporosis, osteopenia occur, but for the vast majority of older, you know, older patients with those diagnoses, it's their, their bones are simply a product of the environment that they've been in. And if they've not been loaded and not been stressed, they get weaker and they get, they get, less dense. And so when you make them start to handle heavier loads and you make them, you know, uh, you progress those loads over time, the bones will, re will respond and will adapt and will get denser and you can reverse osteopenia. There's a great story on the starting strength website about a woman in her early forties diagnosed with osteopenia and the doctors wanted to load her up with all these medications and drugs that allegedly will increase bone density. And she's like, mm, I don't know. I feel like I'm too young for that found our program, started training and literally reversed it and eliminated that diagnosis. And so, I mean, those, those stories are just, there's countless stories, right? It's our basic physiology that's there. We're just taking advantage of it. It's just so wonderful. It's, it's so accessible uh, to everybody and it just is, is such a cause for hope. So thank you so much for course, sharing yeah. your time with us today, Chris. Thank yeah, you. I appreciate the opportunity. We made it through without your dogs barking and my puppy's only just woken <laughs> up just now. So They behave themselves. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Awesome. Thank you, Claire. So I've linked below to the starting strength book mentioned there by Chris, which I've just ordered myself. And even though I go to the gym three times a week, I did realize during this conversation that I'm going to have to get a bit more serious about strength training if I really want to be all I can be as I age. If this is the first time you've watched or listened to one of my podcasts, I'm a journalist on a mission to help you and me understand how to age well, look and feel better for longer. So if you enjoyed this conversation, you can help it reach more people by liking and subscribing if you haven't already, and by sharing this episode with others who you think might benefit from it. You can also find more advice and information from me on my website, honest.scott, and by scrolling down to the bottom of any page, you can sign up for my free monthly newsletter where I round up all my latest content so you don't miss a thing. But for now, thank you for being here today and I hope to see you next time. Mm -hmm.